Is it morning? Yeah, it's still morning. Good morning. Yeah, I've been here for a while. I remember getting here, starting attending here, was it? I think it's like 87. And so um, Randy and I became friends then. You know, we were both eight years old at the time. <laughs> so we started growing up together. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to be part of what's been going on in this church for, for a long time. I've seen the beginnings, I've seen the middle, I've seen where you are now, and there's some things I see, <clears throat> you know, you got, you got a great pastor, he's got vision for the next season, and I'm just really excited for y'all, and normally I'd like to tell a couple jokes and be real friendly and, you know, personally connect with everybody before I give you the message, but I'm really, uh, I'm really hot on this message, so don't assume that I'm being unfriendly, just write it off as, well, he's from New Jersey. He doesn't have any people skills. <laughs> I, want, I just want to get into the message. Um, I'll just assume that everybody here thinks truth is important. But I think I can also assume that many of us don't, we don't really ap appreciate how important truth really, really is. And actually, I think many of us don't really, really appreciate how important truth is to God. You know, he's loving and all, but truth is really, really important to God. And it's, it's such a high value for God. And the fact that he values it, since he's so smart, since he knows stuff, maybe we, it would be good for us to, to see how important truth really is. Let me show you, let me give you an illustration from scripture. Um, it's from um, Joshua. Joshua is a book in the Bible. The Bible is, it's, it's a, it's a best-selling book all over, but there's this Joshua. And in Joshua chapter one, I'm just, doing a little bit of paraphrase. The people of Israel had been rescued out of Egypt. God raised up Moses, God backed his, his play, and he led everybody out of captivity. It's sort of like getting saved. You just get saved. And then God said, there's a land of promise, um, land of milk and honey, but a land of promise, a of, land of destiny. And God led them through the desert for, what, 40 years or so, and God did incredible things. He fed them, he blessed them, he fought for them. Yeah, he disciplined them every, every so often, but he fathered them. He just loved them and brought them from where they were and, and he just blessed the heck out of them. But they hadn't yet experienced the fullness of who they were called to be. They hadn't, ex they hadn't really experienced the fulfillment of why they were here on planet Earth. Um, Lesson one, don't ever confuse the blessing of God with the destiny of God. God can bless the heck out of you. However, there may be more that you may have missed out on. Uh, the people of Israel, because they really didn't listen to God, he blessed them, he blessed them, but they died outside of the full blessing and promises of God. I don't know about you, I don't wanna die in the desert. I, I, I wanna be blessed but I want to experience the fullness of why I'm here. So Joshua is bringing the people over. You know, Moses, he's dead. Uh, bless his heart. Anyway, yeah, for years I didn't know what you southern people meant by that. I thought you were just being nice to me. So um, Joshua is having a, a devotion and and he's ready to cross over. He can sort of see the promised land from across the river. And uh, then God says, okay, prepare now to cross over. And what follows is in, uh, in Joshua chapter one, what follows are some very particular things that God says, do these things now before you cross over. And one of them, and I'm, I'm gonna give an, an essential paraphrase, of Joshua 1, 7 through 9, where um, God tells Joshua, I want you to take my word and meditate on it 
double down on what you think you know. Don't, don't just read it, meditate on it, just sort of immerse yourself in it. And then while you're doing that, remember this is God's word, and so that my word is not just God's truth, it is the truth, and it has authority over any other competitors. That's, ba- that's basically what he said. And it's really interesting, why would God do that to a people who the only word and guidance they had had throughout the whole desert was everything that Moses said, which was basically everything that God said. They already believed in the word of God. They already thought the word of God was great. Yeah, why would God say, double down on this and recommit to its authority? Why would God do this? There's a reason. On the other side of the Jordan, there is the promised land, but there are people living there. There are tribes and there are people groups and there are nations who are living there and they've been there for a long while. And these people, they serve different gods. They had different ideologies. They had different mindsets. There was different ways of thinking, ways of thinking that were so different from gods. But it's not just that they were different. They were actually hostile. These mindsets, there's no room for God's words. There was... They, The ideologies and mindsets and thinking of these tribes, though sincere, would be hostile to God's way of thinking. God God said, I want you to meditate, double down, and then just remember that his word has authority. Why? Because when they go into the promises, when they start advancing, guess what? They're gonna meet up with resistance. And he knows what human beings usually do. They believe what they believe until there's strong countervailing forces. And then we go, oh, well, sorry to offend you. Uh Oh, you know, let's cut a mutual non-aggression pact. Oh, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. Let's just sing Kumbaya. We do that. And God's saying, if you want to be victorious, if you want to be prosperous, if you want to experience the fullness of my plans for your life, Do it my way, and when the stuff hits the fan, you'll be ready. God didn't say, and be prepared to persuade all these people to believe like you. No, 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 no. He's saying, when the assault comes, when it starts getting hotter, when it gets more, when they want to cancel you, what do you, you got to know what you know and believe that God's word is far superior than any competitor. And so he's saying, get it done now, so when it's game time, you won't fall back. Why do I share that? God has led this church incredibly well. It's had good leaders, you know, thank God, but God has led this church. And you know, I know the desert things, but God has blessed this church, you've grown. I mean, it's multicultural, it's just, what a great, there's, there's old people, which is anybody older than me, and young people, which is anybody younger than me. There's such a cross section, this thing is kicking, God's moving, y'all are growing, and you ain't seen nothing yet. You just haven't. You have been fruitful. You have been fruitful and you're starting to multiply a little bit, but, but there's a promised land. There's a way that God wants to lead this church, not to get it on Charisma Magazine, but so you can really reproduce yourself and really advance the kingdom, rescue people from darkness, and people can walk in while they're here on planet Earth. That's what you're here for, and I'm telling you, the desert's been very good to you. The de- God has been really good to you in the desert. But the goodness of God in the desert, it's it's nothing like what God has for you. So at this time, at this point in time in the history of this church, God's saying, uh, double down. Not only on your knowledge of what you think you know, but double down on your commitment to that God's word really is superior to anything else. Why? Why? There is and will increasingly be a war over the truth, both in our culture, in our minds, as we go forward. I mean, 
If you're aware of the political landscape and the cultural wars and all that, I'm telling you, it's nothing compared to what's coming. Nothing. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. When you know the truth, you'll be able to win. Um, if you're not sure of the truth, you'll be scared. But there is a culture war, and it's going to get tougher no matter who you elect. Just saying. But as the kingdom of God goes forward, there's going to be more resistance, and God is telling the church now, prepare now to cross over. Double down. Oh, it fell. Thank you so much. I'm going to drop my wallet and see what he does. <laughs> Let me illustrate what I'm really after. Imagine you're a disciple of Jesus as he's walking the earth. And you're a groupie. It's just they called them disciples then. You know, and you're just following him with a whole bunch of people, people and you got your nose in the middle of his back. Just following him, whatever he does. It's like, it's not like you're an idiot. You go, dang, he just raised the dead. He picked a fight with the Pharisees and he won. Oh, I'm with him, right? And oh, the things he says, I don't understand half of what he says, but it's got an authority that the Pharisees don't have. Everything he says is true, even if I disagree with it, even if I don't understand it. I mean, you're sold out, you're not... You're just following Jesus, and the rest of the group, they're, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You, they just sing this song all the time, Jesus, Jesus. They're just all, they're, they're great disciples. Imagine you're part of this group, and as you're walking along, listening to every single thing that Jesus says and going, wow, that was deep. Never thought about that before. Maybe he really is God. Then Jesus stops and turns around, and flashes his friendly Jewish smile. This goes like that. And he says, uh, watch out that no one deceives you. Another translation says, see to it that no one misleads you, or see that no one leads you astray. I don't know about you, but if I was there, if I was in that group and I'm following Jesus, I would go, hold on here. I'm following you, I'm listening to you, I'm enthralled with you, everything's just good. Wherever you wanna go, I'll go with you. I'm wholeheartedly following you. How can I be deceived while at the same time being a follower of you? How could I do that? Now, I don't really have the answer here for that, but let's just assume that Jesus being God knows stuff that we don't. Just saying. So if Jesus is uh, talking to people who are just following him and love him, really committed, and he says, see to it that no one deceives you, just assume he knows something. Just assume he really, he, he really is aware that you could be a wholehearted follower and be led astray. You can be deceived. That, that, that something can go wrong. You can make mistakes in thinking that are significant. So... What's going to happen, what I'm going to share for the rest of this message is not to criticize anybody. It's not going to say, oh, you're thinking wrong. It stinks being you. I'm not bringing the religious ruler to just tap you on your knuckles and say, bad, bad, bad. I'm not doing that. I'm try I think God wants to use this message to help equip this church to get ready now by doubling down on Scripture doubling down on the commitment to the authority of Scripture, doubling down or on minimizing being deceived so as you go forward, you'll be successful and you'll prosper. That's all I'm doing, okay? Am I setting you up? Yes, I am. Here's one thing that can deceive us. Our ignorance can deceive us. And... I submit to you, ignorance is dangerous. Hosea chapter four, verse six says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That word destroyed doesn't mean you just blow, and, blow up and disappear. That word destroyed is you start coming apart, you start disintegrating. Life is just sort of really fuzzy and it's overwhelmed. You know, it's destroyed like that. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Many sincere people, oh, I, I received Jesus, I love Jesus, 
Boy, she's hot, I'm hot. We like each other, let's have babies. And you get married, you have a nice church service and all that, but not once did you actually consult scripture and say, so what are guys supposed to do in a marriage? Or what are gals supposed to do in a marriage? And how do you raise your kids? And says, so, well, since we committed, we're good. How many train wrecks? How many train wrecks are there where people go, well, uh, I really don't know what God says, or here's the best one. Yeah, I certainly know what God says, but I've got a better idea, that the truth of the world has turned out to be far superior to that old stuff, right? And how does that work? It doesn't work really well. I've, met, I've, met, I've had some really good conversations with some really accomplished warfighters, really just, they're good. And we talk about Jesus and giving their lives to Jesus and all that or doing it Jesus' way. And I can't tell you how many guys say, well, you know, I probably should do that, but if I do that, I'm gonna lose my edge. I'm just gonna lose my edge. And I've talked to a few of them saying, you know something? Actually, you know, you're an incredible war fighter. But when Jesus starts really running your life, <laughs> you'll have a much better edge. You'll be much better at doing what you do because you'll have God leading and guiding and all that sort of stuff. Really? I didn't know that. Hey, look, ignorance is not bliss. Forgiveness. Well, I know, but you know, I don't see him anymore, so I'll just hate him at a distance, right? And some people actually don't know they're ignorant of the freedom that comes to a human soul, soul when they forgive someone. Many of the people who came to this freedom thing, they came to me afterwards, I didn't know I could feel this good. Like I didn't know. You know they, were, they were ignorant, not, not in a bad way, you know, ignorant. But I'm just talking, they just, they just didn't know. What you, don't, what, what you don't know can hurt you. That's another reason, say so whatever it is you're doing in your life, see what scripture has to say and assume that God's ways are probably better than your best day with 13 cups of coffee. Here's another thing, when, when there's behave, you can behave knowing what God says, but you go, our behavior can deceive us. Disobedience can deceive us. In John chapter eight, verse 29 through 31, this is Jesus talking, if you hold to my teaching. Now, holding to his teaching is not just agreeing with it and memorizing it and teaching it to other people. Holding to it is uh, you take it and you put it into practice. If you're from Texas, you wrestle with it. Have you ever noticed that when you know what God wants you to do, it's sort of hard. Sometimes it's just hard. If you hold to my teaching, if you wrestle with it, then you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What's going on here? God's saying, look, when you start putting it into practice and persevere in doing things God's way instead of your way, God's way instead of the culture way, God's way instead of your BFF's way, when you start doing it that, it'll be hard on the front end, but after a while you'll start knowing the truth in a new way and you go, oh, he's a genius. God's a genius. Let's say you have to forgive someone. And you keep on doing it through grit teeth. Oh, there he is again. Oh, I forgive him. You see him the next day. Oh, in the name of Jesus, I forgive him. And it's hard. It is hard. And you go, oh, I have to forgive him. Oh, God, can't I just, I know where to bury the body. Can I just, right? And then you go, oh, I'm mad at him for another reason. He did that bad thing. And his bad thing has taken up all this time for me forgiving him. I mean, there's all this sort of stuff, but you keep on doing it. You just keep on persevering, and one day something happens. All of a sudden, your mind and your soul gets a little freed up. And then the next time you see him, you go, well, there's that jerk, but I, I think I've forgiven him. And then you start praying for the guy. You know what I'm saying? It just takes a while. That you gotta put it into practice, and then you'll really know the truth the way he wants you to know it, and then we'll be genuinely free, okay? Of course, if you know what God says and decide not to do it and just agree with what God says, look what it says here in James chapter one, verse 22. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Don't, how many times 
Have you known what scripture says? And you go, yeah, but God understands. I have got, I, I've got these, God knows, God knows. As if what we feel can override what God says. And what we do is we agree with scripture, but don't start walking it out and we end up deceiving ourselves. Aren't you glad you got up a little late this morning so you could handle this message? Anyway, here's another thing that can deceive us. Now many, you know, the Gen Z people supposedly, you know, this is gonna get all in their feels, right? But uh, it's gonna get in all of our feels. Our hearts can deceive us. Look, having emotions, being happy, sad, being deeply committed, you know, love and all this, it's, it's good, it's good. But our hearts can deceive us. Sincerity all by itself can be dangerous. Let me explain. Proverbs 19, verse two. Scripture says, it is dangerous to have zeal without knowledge. It's, it's dangerous to be genuinely passionate about something without knowing what it is, or, or really passionate about something without knowing what's driving it. I'm not getting political, but there was a time a few years back that, well, there was a movement that hijacked Christian words and Christian virtues and Christian hearts, compassion and all this sort of stuff. And people went, yes, I'm a good person. I care about hurting people. There's nothing wrong with that. But they didn't know what was driving it. They didn't know the ideology that was behind it. And it made things pretty bad. It made things pretty bad. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine, says the heart by itself, there's nothing wrong with our heart. The heart by itself is deceitful above all things. <gasps> Do we really believe that? God does look on the heart. He sees where we're sincere, but God also looks at how we think and what we think. He does. It's good to have passions and feelings and experiences. It's good to have sincere, deep convictions. Nothing wrong with it. But when that starts going into, well, my lived experience, and well, this is my truth, we are in dangerous waters because we live in a culture where my experience and my truth trumps, no politics here, trumps why did I look at Jerry? Anyway, <laughs> no, it, it trumps anybody else's profession of truth. You go, well, that's your truth. Uh, that's your lived experience. Uh, yeah, and what you're really doing in is letting in um, relativism at a very deep level. You know, Jesus, he's full of grace and truth. He's not full of grace and his truth. Our feelings do not determine reality. They may be our reality, but they don't determine reality. Our feelings do not determine truth. Hopefully you all know that. If not, it'd be a good time to prepare now so you can move on. Here's another one. Our sin can deceive us. And hopefully you know sin is dangerous. I just went back to being a 13 year old. Sin. Yeah. Sin is dangerous. It's dangerous in a whole bunch of ways. One could be, let's say, you know, sin is not just doing bad things, just living your own life and your own strength and, you know, utterly independent of God. You really don't need God. Maybe you'll do it on your deathbed and all. And then you get hit by a truck and you die. And guess where your sin leads you? To a place that's really hot, really uncomfortable, and there's no checkout time. Sin is dangerous. That's why we need Jesus. But aside from heaven and hell, sin can be dangerous because you know when you do things that are wrong, you're sowing seeds into your own future and it just gets messed up and sin will do that. The wages of sin is, you know, it's not good. But look at Hebrews chapter three, verse 13. Encourage one another daily, 
as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. How can sin deceive you? Easy. Let's say you were raised within the context of truth and you know that having sexual relations, um, God really cheers that on within a marriage relationship. On the outside of that, no good. It's gonna hurt you. It's gonna hurt your heart and all that sort of stuff. And so we li- I want you to live like that. And here's what happens. And I'm not gonna say it's just the young people, but let's say young people. I, I-, I just wanna dump on the young people for a minute. Yeah. Oh, well, we really love each other and we're committed. Who really needs to be married? And dang, we're really hot. We didn't go all the way. You know, all this sort of stuff. And you're doing this and, and you know you're sinning. Why? Because you don't tell people. You don't tell mom, hey, guess what? I'm shacking up with this guy. You know, he's really nice. Can we have him over for dinner? You don't do that. You don't do that. You hide it and hide it. And after a while, okay, God's not blowing us up. He's not spanking us. He's not doing this. Well, we keep on doing it. And that, well, we probably should get married. No, but we're, you know, I got friendship with benefits. Hey, let's keep on doing this. Let's keep on doing this. Even though we're dishonoring each other, it feels so good. What could be wrong with it? That after a while, you keep on doing something. That thing that you weren't comfortable with, you become comfortable with. And after you become comfortable with, you'll celebrate it. It's such the weirdest thing. Our sin, if we keep on doing it, can deceive us. Here's another one. Our traditions, they can deceive us. And tradition by itself, by itself can be dangerous. Look, tradition to me is, well, this is how we've always done it. This is how I was raised. This is what I was taught. And I'm telling you, a lot of that stuff is awesome. A lot of us have great histories, you know, great church experiences and all this sort of stuff. And, and the issue is not whether or not our traditions are bad. That's not it. The issue is what happens when how we've been raised, what we're used to, you know, how we've been taught. What if that conflicts with what God's asking you to do? What do you do when your traditions conflict with God's will? What do you do with that, okay? Like, well, what would be a good one? Oh, I know, don't get mad at me, I'm not. Look, if you get mad at me, I'm your opportunity to walk in love. You get to forgive me. It's a win-win. Let's say you you have a good traditional Jesus loving background, and you come to this church and you find out there's, you know, there's charismatic stuff, there's spiritual gifts and all that. And you go, well, yeah, yeah, but that's not how I was raised. That's not my tradition. Now I get that. I get that. But but what do you do when you have your tradition and then scripture says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, which are simply supernatural expressions of the reality of Jesus. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts especially prophecy, what are you gonna do? You go, well, I really don't, I don't like that. That's not how I was raised. Therefore, my tradition gets to override my exploring what scripture says. What do you do with that? There's a lot of traditions that's not wrong, but when they conflict with what God wants. Here's where I really wanna land. Worldly thinking. There's a scripture, you won't see it up there, it's at Proverbs 23, seven. It says, as a man thinks within himself, so is he. What this means is how we think and what we think affects everything, everything. It affects how we view ourselves. It affects our, our understanding of our environment. It affects our relationships. It affects how we view God. I mean, it's just, it, it, it just affects everything. So how we think affects everything. And I'm saying worldly thinking is not just dangerous, it's very dangerous, let me explain why. The way God has divided things, it's really simple. There's the kingdom of God. There's a genuinely biblical worldview. You don't have to be a theologian or anything like that, but 
that, and, and within, a, you know, with, with the kingdom of God, there can, can be a lot of disagreements about what this is and what that is, but, but there's a presupposition that whatever is in the kingdom of God, that's what's true. It's not just a truth, but it's true, and it's, it's truer than anything else. You have that. Over here is the kingdom of darkness, a.k.a. the world, the world system. In the Greek, it's, it's cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S. Jesus talks a lot about you know, being in the world but not of the world, all the stuff about the world. And the world is very distinct from the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, it's separate. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians, it says there is no partnership. You can't cut a mutual non-aggression pact between the two kingdoms, between the, the two mindsets. So here's the interesting thing. Over here in the kingdom of God, there's biblical ways of thinking. You know, here's right, here's wrong, here's God's path. This is how God leads us. There's, there's all that. There are mindsets, ways of doing things that are distinctly based in God. And over here, there are mindsets and ideologies and ways of doing things that are no, not only different from the kingdom of God, they're actually hostile, okay? I mean, just think of an ideology that says there is no God. You sort of think that that ideology would be a little different than one that says there is a God, right? So with that in mind, it's just two scriptures I wanna go over. One is in Romans 12 too. Look, I won't hold you to this, but you can raise your hands. How many of you really do want to know God's will for your life? All right, you're in church, you gotta do that, all right? I'm gonna give you a way to start knowing God's will for your life. Romans chapter 12, verse two, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't do things the way the world does things, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, the good, pleasing, and perfect will. Another translation, which I think sort of captures what's really going on here, don't copy the behavior and customs and mindsets of the world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn, notice, then you will learn. Then you will see God's will for yourselves, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Many people, I wanna know God's will, I see a little bit, of it. I need confirmation. Many times, most of the time, God says, look, let me help you think differently. Let's, let's change how things look, you know, your, your perspective, change the worldly from more a, a Bible-centered view. And once you do that, all of a sudden you go, oh, there's his will. It was there all the time. Oh. And not only is it will, because I'm not thinking with worldly thoughts, not only is it God's will, it's not a bummer. It's cool. This is the way to go. It's amazing how much worldly thinking gets in the way of seeing God's will and appreciating God's will. Just does. Now, there's a lot of worldly ways of thinking. And you might go, oh, all right, I get what you're saying, but there are so many thoughts, there's so many things going on. How do I go about the process of thinking differently? How do I find out what's, you know, sort of biblical and, you know, what's, what's sort of worldly? I think it's a lifelong process. Um, but just start here. Just ask yourself, what did God create? Here's someone, some, some options. What did God create? Well, he created man, created woman, and then he, oh no, he stopped right there. And then he created, oh yeah, babies, babies. He created babies, oh yeah, in mommy's tummy. Yeah, God's idea. What else did he do? God created families. 
families. This is God's plan. This is what God created. Biological man, biological woman, getting married, joined by God, and they raise a family where the families have primary responsibility for raising their children, not some outside institution. Right? What else did God create? Oh yeah, he created authority. He created government and things like that. Yeah, some of it's corrupt, some of it's not so corrupt. But God says, look, you know, whatever authority's out there, it's already been established, and here's how you, here's how you navigate this. Instead of going, well, I just don't like it, it gets in my way, let's dismantle it. It's just an amazing thing. So what's, what's sort of, you can, you can start just going, huh, here, I'm, I'm gonna, Brian, are you here? Yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble, okay? Listen, please don't get mad at me. I hate racism and all this sort of stuff, so, so don't call me names. But you know, if you really think about it, there are only two races from God's point of view. There's the Adamic race, the people who are humans. And then the other race are the born again ones. It's a completely new race of people. That's the racial conflict. Really deep. I mean, and I get all this stuff up here. Can you imagine if we looked at racial conflict from that perspective? Then it's like, no, race has nothing to do with your, your color. You know, what we've been calling racial conflict is real cultural conflict. You know, it's, I've lost half of you. Please forgive me. But start thinking, like, how did God think about uh, thing? And then you'll see how worldly thinking has perverted it. Now, at this point, many of you are going, all right, you're going too far. This is like mind control. You know, what do you, what do you, there's our freedom and all. You know, we get to think what we want. Ah, eh, not really. At least not from God's point of view. Um, years ago, I was in, uh, at a university and God was using me. I was a professor there, but he was using me to do revival meetings. And I'm talking about the kind of things that like radio stations came over to find out what was going on. God was doing incredible things. In the middle of the week, I'm in, I'm, I'm in line at a bank because I needed to get some cash. You all remember cash? That, <laughs> anyway, so... I'm there, I'm standing there, and this lady, she looks at me and she comes over, are you that Goodman guy? And I went, uh, yeah, who's asking? Just, are you that Professor Goodman who's doing those, and she did the thing with her head, doing all that revival stuff? And I'm going, why, yes, ma'am, I suppose I am. Yeah, I'm that same guy. And she goes, well, my daughter has been going to those meetings. Now, I had no situational awareness. I just went, well, praise God. <laughs> and, and she goes, well, I'm not happy about it. And she was so mad. She started, she started trying to find a word that was really mean. And she goes, you're just, you're just, you're just. She was stumbling over her just. You're just, you're just. And then finally she found the word. She goes, you're just brainwashing those kids. Now I was young enough in the ministry where I'm going, I'd never heard that before, All right? And uh, go, God help me. And this is what came out of my mouth. It's the Holy Spirit. I go, well, Aunt, ma'am, um, to be honest, you're right. That's exactly what I'm doing. But wait, save the applause. I got a good line coming. <laughs> you're right. You're right, that's exactly what I'm doing. But the issue is not whether or not you're brainwashed. The issue is, what do you wash your brain with? Yeah. If I had just stopped there, <laughs> I didn't. I went, so, what do you wash your brain with? Now, my asking that question then, it was entirely inappropriate. However, asking that question now is absolutely essential. What do you wash your brain with? What do you wash your brain with? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. 
What do you wash? Oh, I have 37,000 people who like me. I'm popular. What do you wash your brain with? What do you, where do you get your information? What fuels and informs your understanding of yourself, your family, the world around you? What do you wash your brain with? It's a legit question. It's important for us to have our brains washed with the water of the word, right? For our own walk with God, it's absolutely crucial. Worldly thinking can actually hinder Jesus' work in us and through us. Let me illustrate. Peter, he was one of those disciples. He had his nose in, in the middle of Jesus' back. I love you, you know. And he, he wasn't smart, but he had revelation. You're the Christ. And Jesus goes, you're right. You're right, you know. Um, and, and, and on the revelation of, uh, of, of, uh, of who I am, the church is going to get bigger. It's going to advance the kingdom. Man, you got it right. And then he goes, oh, and by the way, I'm going to have to be murdered. That's part of the plan. I'm gonna have to die. And you know what Peter does? He would do what each and every one of us do. Because we have good heart, we love Jesus, we love the mission, we don't always understand what he's doing, but we're in all the way, and he goes, I will not let that happen to you. I love you, my heart is for you, I'm gonna defend you, all, he did all that. And Jesus, sweet Jesus, you know the one who's on methadone, who's always walking around smiling? No, not that Jesus. The real Jesus turns to him and he goes, get behind me, Satan. What was he saying? He goes, I detect a very worldly perspective being in injected here. Oh, by the way, did you know that in 1 John chapter five, the world system is ruled by Satan? So it's not a number of different perspectives. The one who rules the kingdom of God and the one who rules that worldly thing, they're two different rulers. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Another translation. You're a stone that could make me stumble because you're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. And then another translation is, you're a trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human, worldly point of view, not God's. As we follow Jesus, he's gonna challenge us to think differently. And he'll expose worldly thinking so we can allow God to change how we think. So I'll get practical here. How do we go forward? Here's some practical things. Here's number one. Start immersing yourself now in scripture. I'm not saying be a theologian. I'm not even saying understand everything, but just start reading scripture as if your life depended on it. Start reading it, listening to it. You know, some of the other things, ah, do something else and just, or listen to it. Whatever it is, start meditating on, start doubling down on scripture. And I'm telling you, scripture's got magical powers, okay? Because the Holy Spirit's in it. The more you, re more you read scripture, even if you don't understand it, God uses it to massage your brain and get rid of old stuff and give you new stuff. That's how this works. The Bible is not just words printed on page, has supernatural power. Immerse yourself in it. Here's the second thing. When an idea or a new craze or a new thing comes along, just stop, don't judge. Don't jump on it. You don't have to react to it. Just stop and go, is this true? It's a legit thing. Is it true? And then the next question is, well, is it biblical? Does it, how, how does this connect with scripture? And just ask yourself the question and then just do a little digging. It will change your, it will change your life little by little by little so that when it's game time for you to start taking the land God promised to you, you could do it from a position of strength. Here's one last thing, and it's so practical, we can all do it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, for though we live in the world, the world, we do not wage war as the world does. 
We, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What are strongholds? Strongholds, well, we demolish arguments, ideas, ideologies, mindsets. We demolish those things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. How do we do this? Well, immerse yourself in scripture, but in the everyday particulars of life, here's a real practical thing. Where'd it go? We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Listen, I have, I'm sorry ladies, I have the best woman in the whole world. She's beautiful, she's kind, she's Christ-like. I learned from her, she's amazing. But sometimes she just irritates the fire out of me. <laughs> no, because she won't argue with me. A gentle answer turns away wrath, you know? And I, re I remember that she's just really frustrating me, she doesn't do things the way I want them to do. And I was starting to get really, right? And so I'm praying, and I'm having these thoughts, these negative thoughts on my wife. And that I do, I go, Lord, I have these thoughts. What do you think of them? I didn't try to change how I thought. I said, Lord, I got these rumbly thoughts. What do you think? And when I did that, you know what he said? She is my gift to you. <sighs> oh, oh, it just, it, my mind got changed. <laughs> We can do that with a lot of things. Oh, that guy's an enemy. Lord, what do you think of that? Well, pray for your enemies. Bless them. Pray they get saved. But that's not what I want to do. Take the thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. You do that as a lifestyle, little by little by little by little. After a while, when you go forward, you go, I know what's true. I know it has authority, and when there's competitors, I'm just gonna assume that God's truth is superior to whatever comes my way. That doesn't make you narrow-minded, that makes you wise, and that will make you victorious in the battles that are sort of coming. So I wanna pray for us, not pray for you, I wanna pray for us. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would begin a season of pouring out the Holy Spirit on this church. Holy Spirit, among many things, you are the spirit of truth. You lead us into all truth. Lord, I ask that you would help us to prepare now to cross over into the new things you have for us. Just sort of put it in our spirits that doubling down on scripture, it's not a theological thing, it's not a, a religious thing, that these words, they're not idle words, they're our life. God, would you help us immerse ourselves in scripture that we would double down on what we think we know and we'd even accord rightful authority to scripture. So when the competitors come, either from the outside or in our own head, we'll know what to do. God, would you do this for our sakes? Do this for our family's sakes. Do this for the sake of the people and the community that we say we love. And most of all, God, would you do this for us for the sake of your name which we carry with us wherever we go. Amen. God bless you.